Okay, let's uh, resume our uh, very uh, packed uh, morning schedule. Before I introduce our next speaker, uh, in my enthusiasm to get the workshop started this morning, I was remiss in acknowledging uh, the incredible uh, work of the ILAR staff, uh, uh, Lita and Angela did, in putting together a world-class program in literally record time. The roundtable participants had our conference call on finalizing subjects uh, on Super Bowl Sunday. We had a conference call right as, I think, during kickoff. Um, and as it turns out, especially for those of you from Denver, it really didn't matter if you watched that <laughs> game or not. <coughs> uh, but if you think back from February to now with all of the speakers and the details and the travel arrangements and actually getting this show on the road, uh, it was an incredible task and uh, we're grateful. So I'd like to thank them for their efforts and for their success. <laughs> Okay, rounding out the morning uh, is a, a bit of a switch from the usual format. Uh, we are going to have an audience uh, participation exercise uh, led by Glenn Begley from Tetralogic Pharmaceuticals. Thanks very much, Stephen. Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here. We heard in the previous session how, it, how important it is to remain humble when we're dealing with biological issues. And I'd like to thank the organisers for making sure that I felt very humble this morning. Given that all of the previous speakers have said what they've said, I feel almost redundant. And then uh, Dr Bourne, I can't see him at the moment, talking about grey hairs in the elevator. Some of us would give anything to have grey hair. <laughs> so thank you again for that humbling experience. Uh, so this is to be an interactive session and uh, we've got some incentives to try and encourage that interaction. So a couple of weeks ago I had the opportunity to present at the American Association for Cancer Research and this is the disclosure slide that I presented. Uh, it's clearly very important. I'm an employee of Tetralogic, an employee and a stockholder. One day, many years from now, that might actually be worth something. Uh, I'm a non-executive director of this company in the UK I'm the SAB member for a number of biotech companies and you can read the rest. For 10 years I was the head of the hematology group at Amgen and uh, prior to that, I say more than 20 years, it's actually quite a bit more than 20 years. I know what you're all thinking, how possibly could he be that old and have accomplished all that when he looks so young? I understand. And I won't discuss the off-label use. Uh, when we first published our paper, I actually received hate mail, I was accosted at conferences and so on, so at the very beginning I want to make it clear that I do not regard anything that I'm going to present as challenging the legitimacy or the validity of the scientific method. I'm not talking about fraud, deliberately not talking about fraud. I'm talking about scientific laziness, sloppiness, ignorance, exaggeration, desperation. That's what I'm talking about. I believe that the vast majority of investigators want to do the right thing and I also believe that this debate is taking place in public and it confirms the strength of our scientific system. So that's where I'm coming from. So the problem we really have is dealing with the biology and I've spent my life trying to understand cancer. Cancer is evolution. In contrast, I like to tease my cardiology friends and with Malcolm here, my neurology friends Cardiology and neurology is just plumbing. The clear advantage they have, though, is that at least most Americans believe in plumbing. <laughs> the real problem we have is dealing with the biology. It's the biology that sets the bar. And when we start thinking about the challenge we face in oncology, and I'll agree, even in neurology, the problem is the biology. The cell lines we use are artificial, our animal models are artificial, the disease is more heterogeneous than we can possibly imagine. That's the real challenge that we're trying to address. But there is an opportunity and it's an opportunity that's inherent to our system. It's much more readily addressed. That involves dealing with the poor experimental design that we've heard about already, dealing with poor reagents, poor analysis, failure to reject the hypothesis that's my favourite hypothesis and deliberate bias in presenting results. So the challenge is the biology. 
That's what sets the bar. But we do have a, an opportunity that's much easier to address in terms of the way we actually practice science. So for me, uh, having spent, I said, more than 20 years in academic research before I joined industry, I was stunned to recognise how much bias plays a role in what's published in the literature. I think we can set the bar, but it's important to realise that we get what we incentivise. And industry relies very heavily on what's generated in academia. So in the period of the decade that I was responsible for the group at Amgen, we were unable to reproduce 47 of 53 seminal papers. These were publications that reported something completely new. They weren't what I refer to as binary publications. So if a cancer has the RAS mutation, it either does or it doesn't. There's no subjectivity there. It does or it doesn't. I regard that as a binary publication. The papers that I'm talking about weren't like that. Uh, like you, Malcolm, when we were unable to reproduce those studies, the first response was, well, Amgen scientists are inept anyway. What was really staggering was that on many occasions, we actually went back to the host investigators that had reported their papers in Nature, Science and Cell and asked them to repeat their experiment. And they were unable to do so in their own lab with their own reagents, simply with someone standing next, in, next to them watching. So that, to me, was uh, frankly shocking. I had not anticipated that at all. There were two occasions when we could reproduce the specific data, but it wasn't a general finding. So for example, if an investigator reported that two siRNAs inhibited the growth of two breast cancer cell lines, and we used those two siRNAs and those two cell lines, we got exactly the same result. But it wasn't general. When we used another four siRNAs, for example, or another 10 breast cancer cell lines, we didn't see it reproduced. So that's subjective, frankly. That was my decision to terminate the program because I didn't think it provided a solid enough foundation to go forward with a drug discovery program. And another problem, we've heard about it already, was data selection bias, where a single non-representative experiment was presented. And the most extreme example was an investigator with whom I had uh, breakfast a couple of years ago at AACR. And this was a paper published in Cancer Cell. And we went through it figure by figure. And we got to figure five. And I said, we've done this experiment 100 times. We just never get this result. And he said, yeah, we did it a dozen or so times too. We got this result once. We didn't see it again, but that's the one that we decided to present in the paper. Now, there were two things to me that were shocking about that. First, that he told me. <laughs> he didn't have to tell me. So he clearly thought that that was OK. There, were, there was no reason that he told me. And then the second thing was that that actually was published and there was no, no commentary that the experiment had been repeated a number of times and not able to be confirmed. So this has had substantial impact. It's wasted the time for multiple investigators, multiple companies. There's not, the opportunity cost is what worries me the most. The real problem we have is trying to address the biology. And I can't even imagine how much time we've wasted following red herrings when we could have been doing something completely different. Some of these papers have spawned entire fields. One of the papers has been cited over 2,000 times. It's got 450 secondary publications. The investigators themselves were not able to reproduce their own work in their own lab with their own reagents. But none of these papers uh, are yet subject to a retraction. And worse, clinical studies have been initiated. And uh, one weekend when I didn't have, it's sad life really, I didn't have much to do. I sat down and counted how many papers, how many clinical trials listed on clinicaltrials.gov had been initiated based on uh, work that investigators themselves could not reproduce. And I stopped counting when I got to 100. Amgen's experience is not unique. And Bayer Health published this a year earlier, that they are only able to reproduce the work in a handful of cases, 20 to 25%, and they terminated programs based on that. The problem is systemic. So I told you there were 53 papers. There were 52 different laboratories represented. So this is not a problem of a single laboratory. It's systemic. And it's, I think, because careers are built on publications in top tier journals. This is what drives grants, fame, promotion. 
the top tier journals want the best story and positive studies are rewarded. We all know what it's like if we've got a positive review back from Nature, Science and Cell and they're asking for a couple of additional experiments. Frankly, there's no point even doing those experiments. We know that when the postdoc goes off to do those experiments, I'll come back with a positive result because we're almost in. We just need this one experiment to get it into Nature. So this is what my disclosure slide should have looked like. This is the unspoken, unacknowledged disclosure information. This is really what's driving the uh, lack of reproducibility in science. This has direct, immediate financial consequences. Tetralogic might be successful one day, I sure hope it is, but this will determine whether or not I get my grants and whether or not I get promoted. So the fact that we've had a couple of papers in Nature, thank you, <laughs> and uh, in the sense of shameless advertising, earlier this year I spoke at the President's Council of Advisors. The fact that I'm speaking here is also developing my career and one day I hope I might get promoted as a result of this. But this is inherent in our system and it's something that we too often fail to acknowledge. So the investigator and the host institution are ultimately responsible. Uh, Fran Visco, with whom I developed a lot of this work, a lawyer in Philadelphia, the head of the National Breast Cancer Coalition, made it very clear to me when I said, you know, this belongs somewhere else. She said, no, Glenn, this belongs to you. This is the investigator and the institution's responsibility. And we will have make headway if we raise the standards for grants and publications. We heard earlier that people should be presenting their preclinical proposals in advance and we should see that as part of the final publication. Uh, I think it's actually too easy to look at the journals and the reviewers of the journals. They only see what's given to them. They only see the end of the process and typically there's been at least three or four years that have gone on before and I think we need to begin at the beginning and that's at the grant funding agencies. We should recognise the value of publishing confirmatory data and rewarding findings that refute high profile studies. So when I went back and looked at the papers, that, the few that we were able to reproduce and those that we could not, there were half a dozen features in common. Those that we could not reproduce showed these sorts of flaws and the few that we could showed the opposite. So here are my six criteria for judging scientific reports and actually it's remarkably similar to what Malcolm's already outlined. Were studies blinded? They're almost never blinded. Were all the results shown? They're typically not. Were experiments repeated? Seldom. Were positive and negative controls shown? Typically not. Were reagents validated? Very rarely. And were statistical tests appropriate? Typically not. So the reviewers and the editors of top tier journals, even with the information they're given, fail repeatedly. And when you've found one such study, you'll find that it doesn't fail just in one figure, it fails again and again and again throughout the paper. 